Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. Alleluia. You may be seated. The text that engages us this morning is from Luke's account of the ascension in his gospel, uh, chapter 24. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer, as we are always remain fixated, seeing you on your throne. Amen. According to the report issued by Pew Forum back in 2015, the religious landscape in America changed drastically in the seven years since its last study. It was in a survey of about 35,000 people that the percentage of adults who identify themselves as Christians dropped nearly 8%. Or to put it another way, one in five adults who had grown up in the church no longer claimed any sort of religious affiliation. Now, I realize these numbers don't necessarily come as a surprise in today's religious climate. I mean, we're I've kind of grown to, accustomed to expecting the number of Christians to decline in our country. But each time the numbers go down, there's a moment where we question, is the church losing? Will the church be okay? Will the numbers ever turn around? Has God abandoned our nation, leaving a remnant of faithful people to ride off into the sunset of insignificance? Does the gospel still have the power to transform people's lives? And as we celebrate the ascension of our Lord, we read Luke's account of Jesus leaving this world to return into heaven, and we might be inclined to ask, Jesus, where are you going? Why are you leaving? It's time to start changing the world. I mean, you conquered sin, death, and the devil. Now it's time to start showing everyone they were wrong about you. This is the church's time. Have you ever thought about everything Jesus could have prevented if he had just stayed here? There would be no division in the church We would solve all of our theological and interpretive differences by going to the one who has the highest authority on the matter. Wouldn't the church be better off if the one who is our head continued to be the one who speaks on our behalf? Or wouldn't Jesus be more effective at spreading the gospel than you or I? It'd be understandable if the disciples had similar questions in our gospel reading this morning. Now, there they were. They were 40 days removed from the single greatest event in human history. Their Savior, risen from the dead. I mean, they were ready to change the world. The hard part was over. The kingdom of God's people finally had their everlasting king from the line of David, who was victorious in battle over sin, death, and Satan himself. It was, start, it was time to start expanding the kingdom, effortlessly pushing its borders to the ends of the earth. It was time for all other kings to bow before the king of kings, for every tongue and every nation to confess that Jesus is Lord. The disciples even ask about this specifically. There we saw it in Acts chapter 1 verse 6. They said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this it? Except something else happened. They walked a mile and a half west of Jerusalem where Jesus gave them a final blessing and then was carried up into heaven. I mean, just when everything seemed to be back on track, when light seemed to finally overtake the darkness, Jesus departs into heaven. It might make sense that the disciples are asking themselves, I mean, are things going to be okay now that he's left us? Will things really change, or are they going to go back to the the way we used to have our lives and, and, and how things used to be? Do we have what it takes to keep this thing going? But notice how Luke records the disciples' reactions after Jesus was 
carried up into heaven. It says, And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. We don't see the disciples cowering behind some locked door like we did back on the morning of Jesus' resurrection. No, this time we see a, a much different reaction altogether. It says the disciples were filled with joy. This was not some joy that came from having all of their questions answered. It was not some joy that came from having things go the way that they wanted them to go. It was not a joy that came from them looking all around them and finally seeing a world that was no longer broken, where people were no longer in pain or in suffering, where Christians were no longer suffering for their faith. No, this joy came from a promise that was now fulfilled in Christ. Their joy came from a word that would never be broken. Their joy came from knowing that they would be clothed with power from on high, equipped with the power they need to live as church when the Holy Spirit would come to them. This joy came from heaven as they saw their king seated on high, sitting on his throne at the right hand of the Father. It's the same joy that even Stephen had as he was being stoned. And right upon the point of where he was ready to die, he, he looked up and all he could see, even in the midst of that world, of all that was going on, all he could see was the heavens opened up and Jesus sitting on his throne, right where he was supposed to be. And for Stephen, just as these, for these disciples, that vision was a source of peace, no matter what they face, knowing that their Lord, our Lord, is king. His work is completed and he does indeed reign over all things. The Apostle Paul described it this way in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And so this is where our eyes remain fixed as we live in this broken world, as things around us seem incomplete or impossible to complete or overcome, we keep our eyes on the throne of Jesus, trusting in His reign, finding peace in His promise for us. Now, you know, we're not told what words Jesus spoke in blessing as before He ascends into heaven, before the clouds take Him away. But as a former professor from the seminary, Norman Nagel once wrote... We do not need the words. We need only look at the hands that he raised in blessing. These are hands that once gently wrapped around Mary's finger as she held him in her arms. Hands that resembled our human littleness and frailty. These hands learned to hold a pen and write the words of Scripture that Jesus knew so well by the time he was 12 years old. These hands worked with hammer and saw, sharing and blessing our work with us. These are the hands that touched the eyes of the blind and the tongue of the dumb. Hands that had taken the hold of the cold, pale hand of a little girl and returned her alive to her mother and father. You know, we read so often of these hands that Jesus stretched them out, touched or grasp with that personal, individual love and help that characterizes those healings of Jesus. You know, he didn't heal people by the dozens or all lumped together, but he was there for each one that needed him as his hands took hold of each one. You know, these are the hands that gathered the little children into his arms to hug them and bless them. These are the hands that gripped Peter when he looked away from Jesus and began to sink into the water. These are the hands that broke the blessed bread and gave them his body to eat. These are the hands that Thomas held and conquered all his doubt. All this, the ascension hands of Jesus say, and we've not yet mentioned the biggest thing of all. 
For in those hands, we see the print of the nails. That jagged scar tells us the full size of the blessing and how it was won for us. All our wrong, all our sins, Jesus took upon himself and bore the punishment for them. He was forsaken as we had coming to us so that we might not be forsaken of God, but forgiven. And because of what Jesus did for us there on the cross, we might be made alive again as children of God. And because his hands were stretched out on the cross on Good Friday, they are today stretched out in blessing on his disciples. The one who ascends and blesses has the mark of the cross in his hand. No cross, no blessing. And that's why the sign of the cross is made every time we offer a blessing. And that's what Jesus means to all of us at his ascension. That life and blessing have been won and given. So the ascension does not mean that that Jesus has gone away. Quite the contrary. He is with us now, even more powerfully than when men saw him. We live then in the presence of our ascended Lord. He who promised, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Because he is with us, we cannot be destroyed. We cannot be overtaken. We cannot be overcome. Jesus has made the way for victory for us. He leads us on that way. He gives us the strength and courage for it. And finally will bring us to our eternal home as we too will ascend from our graves. We go on then from the ascension just as those first disciples filled with great joy. And we look forward to the next week as we celebrate the arrival of the promised one, the Holy Spirit, who comes to lead his church and dwell with us, giving us his power and his might his confidence and his assurance. A promise fulfilled. A blessing for us. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in our Christ, our ascended Lord. Amen.